Our first speaker is Sina Fakur, graphic designer, visual artist, type designer, and researcher based in Lyon, France. He has a BA in graphic design from the Ecole des Beaux-Arts de Lyon, an MA in graphic design from the Ecole Supérieure d'Art et Design de Valence. And he is going to talk about reviving the first phonetic script is the linear elamite. So without further ado, please welcome Sina Fakur. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for your time, and thank you, Pi, for making this possible. As a type designer and researcher, sometimes I question my contribution to the world. I mean, in an endless universe on a small planet, a tiny particle sat in front of a computer is moving anchor points and adjusting busier curves. Sometimes it all seems pointless. But then I think back to what I inherited from past generations, and it gives me perspective. Let me take you back to the dawn of the, civiliza dawn of the civilizations. We are looking for the reason this conference exists and why we are all here today. The very reason we work with letter forms, writing. 5,000 years ago, in the Near East, writing was born. As far as we know, the first writing systems on Earth emerged in Near East simultaneously in three regions, Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Elam. The latter two were home to Mesopotamian cuneiform and Proto-Elamite in about 3,500 BC. They are the first known writing systems and were likely developed from previous forms of counting in the region. You have probably heard a lot about Mesopotamia and cuneiform, but maybe not so much about Elam. Elam was an ancient civilization neighboring Mesopotamia and was located in present-day Iran. It covered nearly the entire southern half of the Iranian plateau in the third millennium BC. The territory went through a lot of changes, and in the Achaemenid period, about 500 BC, it was reduced to only Susa. Elam's particularity compared to Mesopotamia was its confederated governmental structure. Different settled and nomadic populations were united within these structures' complex mechanisms. But the name Elam does not come from the local population. It is a name coined by Mesopotamian scribes. The Elamite called themselves called their country, actually, Hotamti. They used different writing systems to transcribe the Elamite language. Proto-Elamite, one of the first known writing systems, developed into another writing system called Linear Elamite, and was later replaced by cuneiform due to the power hegemony of the Mesopotamia. This is a simplified diagram of evolution of writing in the Near East. Linear Elamite emerged from the evolution of Proto-Elamite in about 2300 BCE, and as far as we know, it was used until 8018 BC. To put it more simply, here are the two parallel paths that writing has passed through in the Near East. Let's make a jump forward. 4,000 years later, at the beginning of the 20th century, archaeologists discovered this writing system in Susa. Today, up to 43 objects containing linear Elamite inscriptions have been discovered. They are named by alphabetical order from A to Z and A' prime to R'. Prime. These objects are now in different places around the world, and only six of them are in Iranian museums. Linear Elamite inscriptions containing simple and complex geometric signs are found carved into different materials. Stone, clay, metal, and one gold seal. So far, of course. 
Not all objects have good legibility. Some inscriptions, those in stone in particular, are severely weathered, making it more complicated for me to analyze. Linear Elamite remained undeciphered until 2020. 120 years after its discovery, François Dosset, a French archaeologist working in Iran for years, announced he had deciphered linear Elamites. He and his team explained in their article that linear Elamite is an alpha syllabary writing system, a very efficient system that works with five vowels, 12 consonants, and 66 syllables. And of course, signs have variants. This decipherment is of great importance because it may change our current understanding of the development of writing. It is the oldest known phonetic writing system, showing that the phonetization of writing was achieved from the earliest stages of, of its invention and much earlier than anywhere else. The Elamites used an efficient system containing alphabetic and syllabic signs in 2300 BC, while Sumerians and Egyptians were still using logograms. A smaller jump now. In 2021, I joined ANRT to work on linear Elamite. ANRT is an amazing research center where I met these lovely people. Each of them has conducted incredible research projects and I encourage you to check out on the ANRT website or even here at this event where some of them are speakers. In short, amazing center, incredible people, fantastic type jokes. My project at NRT was to design an inclusive typographic solution based on comprehensive research and careful analysis of the inscriptions that would make the digital transmission and reproduction of linear Elamite possible. Among others, it would help archaeologists, linguists, philologists, historians, and type researchers during the process of redacting and publishing their research. It, it could also help preserve this, this ancient script and give it a new life through contemporary mediums. I had the chance to have François Dosset as my advisor on this project. This allowed me to have access to the most relevant archaeological references, but also understand the needs he has as one of the main users of the script. Making the first linear Elamite typeface was a delicate task, as it would be the first contemporary visual representation of this writing system. Transposing the typographic rules from one system to another would have been irrelevant. So in my encounter with linear Elamite, I tried to be as neutral as possible, and I tried to base my design choices on arguments rather than the Latin or Arabic typography rules that I'm used to. Reviving an ancient writing system requires the reconsideration of modern typographic notions such as geometry, weight, type, color, proportions, contrast, baseline, etc. These concepts should be evaluated based on the nature of the writing system, but should also be adapted to contemporary mediums such as print and a screen. Almost all of the linear Elamite signs seems to be abstract and very geometric. But since they are engraved by hand, they are not completely regular. My first instinct was to design symmetrical and consistent, consistent geometric signs, an instinct approach. But was this really the intention of the engravers? Was making perfectly geometric signs the goal of the Elamites? Today, it seems natural for us to call a shape geometric after the achievements of Babylonians, the Egyptians, and later on the Greeks with what we know of Euclidean geometry. But was the notion of geometrical abstract shapes understood by the Elamites? To be able to, be able to an answer this question, I followed a rational process by trying to redefine these no notions. Let's start with geometry. I traced back the history of abstract geometric thinking and figured out that the ability to reproduce intentional geometric forms has been with human beings from tens of thousands of years. Let's 
There are over 5,000 geometric paintings recorded in 146 Paleolithic European caves dated from 40,000 to 10,000 years ago. I also had to figure out whether the Elamites intended to engrave symmetrical forms. For this, I worked with the signs attested the most in the inscriptions. I and analyzed them in all, all of the objects. This is the sign representing the sound A. Ah. I detached it from all its occurrences and I scaled them to the same size to remove the proportions factor and focus on its skeleton. I did not notice any asymmetrical pattern. I then traced each sign being as loyal as possible to the inscriptions. I superimposed my drawings to achieve the average shape of the sign. The result, the denser area, leans toward the symmetrical diamond. I repeated the process with the sign representing the sound re. And despite the more complex form, I could draw the same conclusion. Now was consistency desired. I noticed that the similarities between identical signs are not negligible, which shows an intention to reproduce the same forms in an inscription. I then compared different size signs made with similar shapes. I could also observe a convincing level of shared features between them, making each object coherent and consistent as a whole, a phenomenon that cannot be accidental. In my analysis, cons consistent patterns in proportions emerged as well. Let's look at abstraction. Because linear elamite is, developed, is a developed form of the proto elamite script, the most linear elamite signs have potential proto elamite equivalents. The signs in both writing systems are abstract forms that do not seem to represent any object or being. In the process of evolution from proto elamite to line linear elamite, the forms became more simple and stylized. In linear elamite, the imprint of tools is blurred, and we are left with more graphic contours rather than embossed imprints. For example, the, the round imprint you see here in proto-elamite tablets has evolved to just the contour of a circle. The triangular strokes, those were reduced to thin lines. Additionally, the previously detached strokes became more connected and started forming integrated shapes. Now there is one inscription that stands out in the 43 objects. This is the exceptional inscription Q or the Maravdash vessel. The inscription on this object seems to be meticulously planned out. Similar forms are almost identical in shape and size. The spacings are well calculated. The signs are centered vertically between the two lines. The Maravdash vessel is a clue in confirming what the engraver's, engraver's intentions were. Symmetrical, geometric, consistent signs. Speaking of engraving, when working on an engraved script, the analysis of the materials and tools can help the designer through better understanding of how the forms were, sh were shaped. This is why I tried to experiment engraving on a stone, metal, and clay with different tools. There is no information about what tools were used to engrave linear elamite. But based on observations, practical tests, and also by looking at early Greek inscriptions, I could make some hypotheses that helped me in design decisions. For example, in the inscriptions, the strokes are the thickest somewhere in the middle and then fade away at their extremities. I analyzed how potentially the combination of a round tool and a curved surface contributed to this trait. 
What you saw was a glimpse into some parts of the research that resulted in my typographic solution. Hot empty typeface. Let me take you through a very brief overview of my design process. First, I started by drawing the sign A as its shape is dominant in the script, not only because it represents one of the most repeated sounds, but also because by adding elements on top, at the bottom, or inside of it, we achieve numerous other signs. By reserving some space on top and the bottom of the sign A, I could have the same optical size of these components shared between different signs. By repeating this form, I aim to add harmony to the typeface. For re and te, however, as they are bigger, I drew them in a way to fill these spaces. I applied the same logic to the other characters and eventually a system emerged in which we could have four main heights for the signs. This system allows for consistency without over homogenizing the signs. The different heights also prevent the typeface from being too mechanical. Most signs easily fit into this system, but I did not want the grid to determine the design. Therefore, some smaller signs, about 5% of them, make the inevitable exceptions. The main use of the typeface being academic papers, I had to consider how, to, how it would interact with Latin and Arabic script. These two scripts being used the most in academic papers related to linear elamite and the Elam civilization. I made linear elamite signs taller than Latin or Arabic characters. The reason being that Hatam T regular is much lighter than these scripts. And so by making it vertically bigger, it won't appear unnoticeable in the middle of Latin or Arabic text. This way, neither of them dominate the other, but they are still easily distinguishable from each other in the line. The main style of Hatam T has a contrast and comes in regular and bold. Contrast gives it materiality and suggests the trace of the engraving tool. The bold version will be helpful in pairing with bold texts of Latin and Arabic so that the linear Elamite script doesn't appear so weak in the line. Hot MT is a font family of four styles, regular, bold, stroke, and stroke bold. The stroke version represents the skeleton and a graphic representation of the signs. The traces of the carving tool and the material are completely erased in this version. In transcribing archaeological ins inscriptions, we are often faced with less legible signs due to corrosion and scratches. To be able to represent this, I introduced different hashures representing three degrees of corrosion. By typing an asterisk once after a sign, a hashur superimposes on the glyph twice, and the hashur becomes denser. Now, by typing the asterisk three times, we are left with only the dense hashur without any sign underneath. Since linear elamite is not yet in Unicode standard, I put the glyphs into the Latin code points that have the same phonetic values. In this way, typing in linear elamite with a standard Latin keyboard is, is made possible. Even after the integration of linear elamite in Unicode, keeping this feature would be helpful as it is an intuitive way of typing. In addition, the integration of a script in Unicode would not necessarily guarantee the emergence of keyboards for the scripts. There, here is the four different levels of transcription process of an object. And these are some images showing how Tamtin used for transcription. And here is the complete glyph set, about 300 glyphs. One last jump. Yes, we are but tiny particles, but so were the Elamites. Yet they created the very reason we are all here today in this auditorium. 
They likely had no idea that 5,000 years later, someone would design a digital font out of their hand engravings. A few weeks ago, one of my students told me she, won she watched my presentation on the subject several times and that she would like to follow the same path and become a researcher in the field. You can't imagine how humbling and inspiring this was to me. This ignited a fire in my heart. Her research will likely be read by others and ignite further inspirations. Yes, we are particles, but particles collide with each other, move each other, and share momentum from one side of the world to the other. I would like to imagine and I hope that we are particles that thousands of years ago invented writing and are now igniting each other's torches until the light reaches those who need it. Thank you. Thank you, Sina Fakur. I am exactly on time, 20 minutes. <laughs> this is one of the best timed presentations, so great stuff. Um, anybody has a question? I can, where? Okay, here we go. Hi there, uh, congratulations. I'm absolutely mesmerized by your, um, by your outcome and conclusions. <clears throat> now the question, um, do I read it in the right way that uh, the linear mal mal uh, elamite was um, the writing system that uh, was using vow representing vowels and was not a uh, continuous writing because they were using dividing crossbars even before, uh, I mean, that it was revolutionary in a way, uh, looking at the context of other writing cultures. Am I reading it right? Um, I'm not sure I understood your question, but it is, um, as far as we know, mm -hmm. uh, it is the it is an alpha syllabic writing system. It consists of consonant and vowels and syllables, mm -hmm. and like every, any other alpha syllabic. Uh, mm -hmm. writing system. And yes, there is dividing bars. Sometimes they are used, sometimes no, mm -hmm. which divide different words and phrases which mm -hmm. from each other. And That's the structure of the writing. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you make any research on if the Canaanite, um, the Canaanites yes, were somehow connected with this culture, right? Actually, they are not really connected because it is can I, can, um, the Egypt, it is the evolution of Egyptian hieroglyphs that one, mm -hmm. while this is completely in another region, which is Elam. Mm -hmm. We cannot assume any connection between them because we don't have any proof. Maybe they were inspired by, by each other, but I don't know. But anyway, it was that one is 800 years after Elamite. Linear element. Yeah, I was asking about like inspiration with geometrical and simplifying, yeah. so that could yeah, be possible. It can be possible, but we, for now we don't have any clues. Okay. Even for Egyptian hieroglyphs, mm -hmm. there is not any clue that um, what are the roots and if they were inspired by the Mesopotamians or otherwise, mm -hmm. we have no clue about this. Amazing, thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Sina. Hi. Um, we in Lebanon, we, they always tell us that the Phoenicians made the first phonetic uh, writing. And now what I'm understanding that this was even maybe before. So it was before the Phoenicians. Yeah. So now history will be re rewritten. Actually, and this was, um, so this is so recent. In 2020, uh, François Dosset announced this and the article uh, the official article uh, came out in 2022, so it is so recent. Before that, the, it, there, were, there was this hypothesis that this is phonetic uh, writing system because of the number of the signs, but they were not sure. Now with what Francois de Sey and his team, of course, there are five different archaeologists, has announced, we are pretty sure that this is the first, for now, first phonetic writing system. But I'm not an archaeologist, for sure. I will not. Okay, thank you, Sina. Thank you so much.
It's me, Dan Radigan.